Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's July 17, 2021, and in this special episode, we bring you a recording of the economic update given to the conference of the Myanmar Update 2021. This seminar is convened by Edgar Rodriguez of the International Development Resource Centre, the IDRC, and features talks by Vicky Berman of the Myanmar Centre for Responsible Business and previous UK ambassador to Myanmar, and Dr. Tui Tui Thang, Associate Professor in International Business at Curtin University in Australia. A question and answer session follows with questions from online, relayed by Edgard, and from the floor in Canberra, live at the conference. So, handing over to Edgard now. Thank you very much. And so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Edgar Rodriguez. I am the lead uh, for the Myanmar Initiative at the International Development Research Center here in Ottawa, Canada, on traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Since 2017, our Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar Initiative, which is a partnership with Global Affairs Canada, has aimed at nurturing a new generation of young actors in Myanmar to promote better public policy for gender equality, greater inclusion, and prosperity for all in Myanmar. From the very start of uh, the initiative, we have appreciated the energy and the insights and like-mindedness of our Australian colleagues. The exchanges with ANU professors, such as Professor Charlotte uh, Galloway, as well as meetings with other faculties in other uh, universities across the country in Australia, with colleagues from the Australia Myanmar Institute in Melbourne, and of course the ambassador and the staff at the embassy in Yangon, have simply enriched our experience as a Canadian agency providing support to scholars in Myanmar. It has also helped us provide a better support um, to people inside the country who are always looking for a better way way of developing their capacities and exercising their, um, their scholarship. We thank the organizers to make some online space to some of the work that this initiative has produced, and you can see that in their in the conference uh, website. A special mention goes to Chantornel. We appreciate uh, his work as research director at the former Myanmar Development Institute that brought us together in one of one um, in more than one occasion with other Canadian colleagues. As a fellow economist, I'm particularly flattered. I'm pre- have a privilege of introducing this segment of the update in which, as Nick has mentioned, Sean has usually taken the lead with his brilliant remarks, his incredible deep understanding of Myanmar and a sharp sense of humor that we all have grown to appreciate. I really hope, uh, we all hope for his prompt release um, so that he can join us in future editions. Yesterday, we heard the political update by Professor Morton Pedersen, who said something that has stayed in my head uh, during the entire day. And he, and he said that in Myanmar, economics comes second and politics first. Politics explains much of what to be all witness in the economic developments in the country. In the last decade, Myanmar has seen an incredible economic growth has shoot through the roof, making the country one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing Asian economy. However, in 2020, Asian Development Bank estimates a decline of almost 10% of the GDP, the only economy in Southeast Asia to contract that year. ADB does not provide any forecast for 2022. So we can safely say that politics, the major political developments that we have experienced in Myanmar are playing a major part in this drop. Today, we have two brilliant minds who are well-respected observers of Myanmar's economy and society. They will provide their views on businesses and the economy in general in connection to this poli- the political situation and the situation and the human rights and give us a, a complete uh, view of what are the recent developments there. We have Vicky Bauman, has been the director, he's been the director of Myanmar Center for Responsible Business since July, 2013. I met her in 2015 or 16 for the first time when I was still trying to learn more about Myanmar. Prior to her work at the center, Vicky led global mining company Rio Tinto's policy approach to transparency, human rights, and resource nationalism. She was director of global economic issues 
and G8 Sue Sherpa for the United Kingdom from 28, uh, 28 to 2011. And she was the head of the Southern African Department in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the UK government from 2006 to 2007. Vicky has served uh, as an ambassador of the UK to Myanmar from, 22 to, from 2002 to 2006, and as a second secretary in the embassy from 1990 to 1993. She has also worked in Brussels as member of cabinet of the European commissioner, Chris uh, Patton in, the, in 19, 1999 to 2002, and as a press spokeswoman for the UK representation to the EU. Vicky holds a master in natural sciences from the University of Cambridge and holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Bradford. And she is a honorary fellow of Pembroke College. We're going to have her follow by, uh, by Professor Tuatwe Stein, Associate Professor in International Business at the School of Management, Curtin University, Australia. Um, Professor Stein uh, researches interdisciplinary and examines the role of responsible business in building sustainable businesses and communities, especially in developing countries. Dr. Tain has country-specific expertise and close to 20 years of experience as a scholar on business and economic development in Myanmar. She is currently engaged in research projects on responsible businesses, governance in global production networks, corporate to social responsibility, foreign direct investment and conflicts. And she also looks at human resource development in the institutional context of Myanmar. Dr. Tain has recently been co-awarded an ARC, the Australian Research Council Discovery Grant, to examine employment relations, business practices, and corporate social responsibility in global production network of garment manufacturing that is so vital to the economy of Myanmar. Each of our uh, presenters will have about 15, 15 minutes, and we will open after that with questions after that both presentations. So without further ado, I uh, would like to give the floor to Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I am speaking to you from Kalor in Southern Shan State, uh, which is the ancestral land of many uh, different indigenous peoples. Um, I believe that Kalor is either a Danu word meaning a uh, wok or because it's a bowl in the mountains or else it's a Shan word meaning bullet market. There's still a d discussion over that, but it is also a area um, with many uh, Palaung, uh, Danu, Pao um, and Townsu and other uh, ethnic peoples. Um, so I'm going to make a speech rather than a presentation. Uh, Toy Toy, I think has got some slides. But I wanted to anchor my remarks around some of the uh, discussions I had with Sean, uh, to whom the session is being dedicated. So like um, many of uh, Sean's Facebook friends, and he has about 5,000 um, at last count, when I heard the news that he'd been detained by the military at Chaitrium Hotel in early February, I flicked back to my Facebook messenger to remind myself what we'd been talking about most recently, because I suspected that... Um, whoever had been arresting him was doing the same thing. Uh, we were last in contact on the 30th of January. At that time, uh, judging by our messages, we were talking about the potential finalisation of the draft Myanmar Economic Recovery and Relief Plan, which was the second COVID relief plan. Um, my organisation, Myanmar Centre for Responsible Business, had made some earlier comments on this, and I'd actually also been asked um, by Winston Set Aung to make the objectives smarter, which if any of you has ever done smart objectives, you'll know is not much fun. Um, but I'd, I'd done my best. And uh, incidentally, that plan still remains mentioned by, by the SAC, although it's never been finally launched. So they do seem to have used our work as a reference point. Um, we were discussing our views on holidays, but that was about tax holidays. Um, I was concerned that, and indeed was shown, that um, the Investment Commission had far too much propensity to give tax holidays, which I didn't believe were necessary, particularly in the mining sector, where um, you don't need to uh, offer a tax holiday to attract someone to come and invest in mining in Myanmar as opposed to Cambodia. It's all about the, the asset and the resource, so it should be based on that. 
my experience in working for Rio Tinto is also that uh, tax holidays create resentment amongst uh, national stakeholders and therefore that actually is a political risk for the investor. And then the other thing we were discussing around the plan was skills training. Um, and I've been making suggestions that um, the government really needed to engage with the private sector to find out what the real skills needs were and how those could be addressed. Because quite often we'd seen skill training programs set up by government or development partners, which weren't actually meeting a gap in the market. Um, Sean was expressing the hope that the NLD government would ignore some of the IMF's advice. Um, which he felt was too um, uh, sort of hard line on maintaining a grip on public finances. And he felt that there was a case for some more expansionary um, economic policy uh, to help to uh, escape from uh, COVID. Um, and then I look back and a week earlier, he was, uh, he was doing quarantine in Napidor. It was day five out of 14 days. And he, he shared with, some, with me something he described as his unfortunate little secret. And I want to emphasize here, given what he's been charged with under the Official Secrets Act, this is definitely not an official secret, um, but rather he said, and I'm, I'm not gonna do an Australian accent, I'm not going to try. Um, Sorry, I didn't get back to you last night. I got a last minute proofreading job to do from the Ministry of Planning, Finance and Industry. My unfortunate little secret is that I spend a huge amount of my time proofreading for English, the vast amount of memorandums of understanding that Myanmar signs up to, but at least it's tangible work. Um, and I think that's, that's really, you know, Sean is, I think, a utilitarian. I think he's always, above all, wants to do tangible work for the benefit of, of Myanmar. And I really hope that the, the time will come when he is able to continue to do that. I first met him, I think, in a, a Burma Studies conference in, in DeKalb, Illinois in 2004, where he and Alison Vickery and Wiley Bradford were all working on the economics of Myanmar migrant workers in, in Thailand. And unfortunately, that is as live a topic today as it was then. Um, for myself, I was um, at the time presenting a paper on pulp fiction set in Myanmar, but uh, a couple of years later, I sat on a panel in Singapore at the Burma Studies Conference exactly 15 years ago, um, together with David Steinberg, Robert Taylor, Mary Callahan, and the uh, Myanmar ambassador to the U of UK, Dr. Chul Win, who's now no longer with us. And he and I were both uh, trained as pathologists, um, and we were reflecting on what we were seeing of the ongoing slow burn disease and crisis within uh, Myanmar. Um, those remarks actually got published by ANU um, in a uh, publication that came out in 2007 called Myanmar, the State, the Community and the Environment. And in particular, I was talking about the, the seven step roadmap. And then later I, I wrote something for Irrawaddy called The Burmese Patient. And it's sad to see that many of the symptoms we were all identifying then and you know, the underlying disease really are, are still with us today, although this time the, the prescription from the military is a, a five point roadmap rather than a seven step one. Um, but it is all so much more acute today. And above all, what's so much more acute is, is COVID. And uh, really right now, this has abs absorbed all of our emotional energies um, as we both try and avoid it for ourselves and our families, but also on a daily basis, we're um, seeing the announcements of three, four, five people who have died, parents of friends and so on. Within my team, uh, I have two um, members of the team who both, um, they have COVID along with all of their families. And I hope that for them, it's only a mild uh, case. What I wanna do though, is look back um, because one of the other things that we discussed with, with Sean uh, back in December 2016, in fact, it was his first message to me, was some of the positive steps that were being taken by both the new NLD government, but also were continuations of good reforms that had been started by the same, same government. Um, at that point in December 2016, it was a year after the NLD's election victory. And generally there was a kind of gloom that nothing was really moving. The, the sort of optimistic expectations were not playing out. And I'm afraid part of that was due to the um, appointment and the underwhelming performance of another Dr. Chorwin, although I put doctor here in inverted commas as the finance minister. Um, and we were seeing no apparent vision for the economy um, and no real understanding of the private sector by the NLD. In fact, it had taken a number of steps which uh, seemed to actually be almost intended to hurt it, particularly the, the pausing on a lot of construction projects. Um, and the NLD really seemed to view business with suspicion rather than creators of, of jobs and, and growth. 
Uh, so perhaps what Morton was saying about you know, the economy coming second, I think, was very much true of the NLD government. And at that time in December 2016, I felt there were some things that were worth celebrating, that were worth raising awareness of. So I began a, a crowdsourcing of, um, a, on a Facebook post, uh, which I called Reasons to be Cheerful, um, that would sort of collectively both remind us what was going on, but also um, give ideas for what should go on in, in future. Um, so my own uh, suggestions, I started off with three, were that the fact that the NLD had brought in a very well thought through anti-corruption code for civil servants, which they announced immediately on coming into government, um, that set a reasonable limit for gifts. Previously, it had been 300,000 chat. They brought it down to 25,000 chat. Um, and even more welcome, I felt, was they actually then publicly shamed a company who had uh, tried to give one of Aung San Suu Kyi's team a, a brown envelope with five million chats at a Finjan um, uh, festival um, uh, performance. And I felt that that was also very necessary to show that, that times had changed. Um, what they what they did was put that five million into flood relief or, or disaster relief, as far as I can remember. Um, another positive thing they done was pause new mining permits. Um, it was quite clear and it remains quite clear that the mining sector and the governance of it requires a completely uh, radical overhaul. Unfortunately, the Australian government had planned to, to help with that uh, back as far as 2013, but the law on which um, it was going to have to work to, to help on building rules was in itself completely flawed and was based on the old laws. And so that programme never came off. And to this day, the mining sector is in need of total and utter overhaul if it's ever going to be sustainable and contribute to public finances. Um, so not issuing permits was a good move on the part of, of the, the government, although it did in some areas, particularly Jade, then drive greater illegal mining outside of the permit system. And then the final and very important reform that had taken place was the new 2016 investment law, which incorporated responsible business into its objectives and was being um, implemented by the Ministry of um, Planning and Finance at that time in a positive, transparent way. They had uh, undertaken that law and the consultation around it, uh, which involved a couple of Australians, um, but reached out and consulted pri private sector and civil society. This was under the same, same government. And the law itself, I think, was a good solid piece of legislation, which has been relatively easy to implement and welcomed by all stakeholders. So those were positives. And then um, some of my Facebook friends jumped in and suggested other positive reforms we should celebrate, such as obviously telecoms liberalisation and how that was facilitating mobile money. Um, the fact that there was a national financial inclusion strategy being developed, again, uh, very much tied to, to mobile money. Um, Win Myo Thu of EcoDev highlighted the work of the Maguay NLG Chief Minister, Dr. Al Myo no, Nyo, who's currently under arrest. He had managed to save 14 billion chats from the road construction budget for Maguay within the region simply by reviewing the original estimates and adjusting these and so ending up with much more realistic budgets but not compromising the construction quality and quantity and that is very much in line with something called the construction sector transparency initiative which we had been looking at potentially um, having introduced in in Myanmar uh, and as he pointed out all those 14 billion chat could be going towards public services and it was good to see a few years later that Almyo Nyo was the first of the chief ministers to embrace the work of Uwan Chi at the Anti-Corruption Commission and to introduce a SMS-based survey system for public services, which they called Pizijin or fulfillment, uh, which would send you, uh, which would take your telephone number if, for example, you gave birth in a hospital um, and then send you a message saying, how was it for you? Um, and as a response to that, you were able to say, well, actually, you know, there were far too many brokers in the, in the hospital wards and I had to pay tea money to the, um, the gynecologist or obstetrician. Or you could say, no, it was a very good service. And this, I think, was a really groundbreaking move towards having much more responsive public services, which was being supported by the World Bank um, at the time of uh, in 2020, at the time of the election. And now, I imagine, has been abandoned. Um, 
Something else uh, that uh, happened was the start of a, a removal of red tape. For example, the Ministry of Commerce had been abolishing the need for specific import licenses for around 300 products. Um, this is something which I think the, the existing SAC minister, al U, is trying to continue and particularly now focused on the importance of getting oxygen concentrators, oxygen cylinders into the country at this time of crisis. So it's good to see that at least within a few elements of the military regime, there are people who are really trying to, uh, to do their bit. Unfortunately, they are few and far between. Um, and then we also had a comment from Melinda Tun, Australian Myanmar lawyer. She commented that it had really gladdened her heart from the point of view of rule of law that she'd sat in meetings now with central bank officials who would brought copies of the new financial institutions law to the meetings and they would refer to those to determine the scope of their powers. And I think it's interesting now also to see in the face of the bank crisis how um, the central bank has been overstepping its powers in some cases by telling banks that they must send them all the list of people doing CDM, um, that they must sack them if they're not coming back to work. Now, those are not in the financial institutions law. Those are private matters between the bank and their employees. And I'm glad to see that banks are pushing back on that. And then there were a number of positive things which have taken place in the environment at that time, such as the announcement within the Mergui Archipelago of um, the first locally managed marine area, which FFI, Flora and Fauna International, had worked with the Department of Fisheries and with the local communities, including Mokken, to give them exclusive permanent access rights, but ensuring conservation zones as well for the critical coral reefs and seagrass in that area, which is highly um, uh, valuable for conservation. Uh, Another good thing was the, um, the work that had embarked, uh, been embarked on by the Environment Ministry together with the Electricity Energy Ministry, which was in itself novel that they were cooperating. Um, and they were working with the IFC on a strategic environment assessment of the hydropower sector, looking at all of Myanmar's river basins and where you could get at least better, if not good, hydropower installed, as opposed to some of these extremely damaging large projects which had been uh, inherited from the SBDC government. And the outcome of that study, which was finally published um, with the agreement of both ministries in November 2020, would give a very good basis to put an end to the Miesong power project, amongst others, and instead to concentrate future hydropower on less sensitive river basins and not on the main stem rivers such as the Salween. Then forestry, there'd also been again a, um, and then to subcontracting logging, um, which had been granted to crony companies. They'd stopped at issuing export permits for illegal logs that had been seized by the government, which had previously been a way of legalizing the illegal logs to make them exportable to Europe and the US. And then there was the start of a much better planning process. Um, Master plans were being developed for Yangon, for Mandalay. Here in, in Kalor, um, our local MP was very active in trying to establish planning rules that were going to be um, focused on livability and conservation. So lots of good things were going on even back in 2016 and continued um, throughout the NLD's um, uh, tenure. Sean was very uh, positive about this approach. And so when he messaged me, he said, oh, dear Vicky, I love your reasons to be cheerful campaign. My main task at the moment is precisely what you suggest, consolidate and create meaning around the very many small but meaningful reforms that have been put in place, celebrate these, but then use them as a platform for a new wave. I'm very confident this can be done and that it will be approved. Above all, it has to be. Got a great reaction so far and the new policies themselves are being drawn up all pro-growth, all pro-making this country what it can be. Cheers, Vicky. So I've just mentioned a selection of the economic reforms um, that were taking place, and they all built on significant steps towards transparency and liberalisation, which had started to be taken under the USDP Fain-Sain government. Um, we saw many further steps after December 2016, steps in microfinance, steps in insurance. The financial sector obviously was something Sean was particularly focused on. Sadly, there were full steps. Um, there were some big missing pieces. Mining reform remains one. And they never made um, good use of the, that hydropower report. Uh, they had very much the opportunity to cancel some of those dams, which are now coming back under Minan Lines push to potentially haunt the people of those areas. 
Um, it was also a very unnecessary distraction to change the financial year um, and never properly explained, uh, but it will be equally unnecessary if Minan Loing uh, changes it back as he seems to be um, uh, obsessed by doing. But overall, the trajectory was very positive. Um, the trajectory was positive in the private sector as well. And we in MCRB were working um, on our transparency report, Quintissa, uh, to try to encourage the private sector to focus on its corporate governance and focus on its transparency, make their companies stronger, which in turn would strengthen the economy and strengthen Myanmar and make it much more competitive, much more transparent, and for the companies much more able to raise funds for investment. And I do believe that one reason that people were marching in the spring revolution was precisely to protect those reforms and to protect the benefits that were flowing from them. Um, those included more consumer choice of which beer you drink, which telecoms operator you use. There were many jobs flowing into not just the urban areas, but also into rural areas. There was less corruption, thanks to people like uh, Amyo and Yo um, and uh, the former corruption commission uh, Chairman Aung Chi. There was more public spending happening on public on services, education, and health, um, and general improvements, the quality of life, and people's freedoms. And I think that you know the marches were very much about wanting to stop the military from turning the clock back to all those failed autarkic economic policies of su self sufficiency and cronyism that we'd seen under the SPDC. And as Edgar has has noted. Since the coup, the economy has gone into free fall. Uh, the root cause is undoubtedly the coup, the crisis of confidence it sparked. Um, although I do think that in some cases, actions by resistance to the coup have actually served also to contribute to the damage of the economy. In particular, I believe that ways um, that action was taken to try and damage banks is, is actually uh, self-defeating and ends up hurting the depositors, the SMEs who are now queuing to try and get get cash out. Um, so what I hope um, is that in the future, although I have no guaranteed prescription for Myanmar's multiple crisis, and I don't know anyone who does from, from any walk of life, I do believe collectively what we need to do is work together to protect and retain as much as we can of those economic reforms that were pursued since 2012, uh, 11, 12. And we should use that that question of is this going to protect those reforms as one yardstick to determine what advocacy what policy approaches both individuals take and the international community takes and i do think we should recognize that reforms were made by the Myanmar private sector um, they were imperfect and they were incomplete but they're definitely valuable and we should hold on to them and we should particularly incentivize Myanmar companies to continue to reform their governance, their business integrity, uh, because um, they need to be able to see that they will be able to survive by doing that and that they will be able to access capital, whether it's on commercial terms, whether it's from development finance institutions. But on the other hand, if they don't see that they're being recognized for that, and actually if they see that being responsible will undermine their ability to survive in the military economy, I fear that the ones which don't want to act irresponsibly will give up they'll leave like Telenor um, or they'll give up as, as Myanmar companies. And then the ones that remain are going to fall back into the old ways. And um, as Yoda would say, you know, take the path to the dark side. So we do need to keep them engaged in reform. Um, and I hope you'll join me in doing that. Um, and I hope that we will see a, a return to some reasons to be cheerful in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Um, We're going to move on to uh, Professor Trey Trey Tain. Uh, Vicky, your, your views, are there reasons to remain cheerful are more important than ever? And this dialogue with uh, Sean, um, it, it really sparks uh, a ray of hope in the, in the conversation that I hope we can retake in the, in the, in the question period. Um, Dr. Tain, you are ready to go. If they can put it on the, um, on the uh, presentation mode. Thank you. So my um, presentation is focused on three things. 
So I want to uh, continue on the impact of the coup on the Myanmar economy and bring in the topic of what international businesses, foreign um, investors are expected to do, what they've done, and really want to focus on the current debates about sanctions. And, uh, you know, you can see now more nuanced approach to framings and start to see divisions among uh, commentators, you know, what, which way we want to um, continue. So two successive crises that have caused uh, immense economic damage and human misery and the coup, of course, has, um, you know, has unleashed a pre unprecedented chaos and uh, disability, uh, destabilized the economy and uh, um, politics, and people of Myanmar face the grim reality that, as Vicky has said, a decade of gradual economic progress are now being reversed and they are all put at risk to lose and more pain to come. And as we've seen over the last two, two days, we've talked about how Myanmar economy has, um, instead of growing, instead of the forecast of growth of 7% or so, now has shrunk. And it's not at all um, you know, uh, surprising. So at an es a conservative uh, estimate, 10% has shrunk. So this has really reduced the you know, mobility, the ongoing disruption of critical public services in addition to banking, logistic and uh, internet services. So it's um, a really a grave concerns also about um, you know, the, with the internet uh, uh, shortages and you have this uh, grave concern to data security and human rights impact and all linked to military monitoring of internet usage and data the flows. We've seen this civil disobedience movement and the impacts, so we're not going to go um, in detail on that. So the, the potential economic impact and effectiveness of international trade sanctions, um, that's kind of secondary. You know, what we can do from outside Myanmar is not as big as what the internal factors and this CDM is going strong, you know, despite all this, um, uh, um, you know, uh, repression. And that's what uh, people inside Myanmar and outside Myanmar are also uh, hoping for. So this uh, CDM has drawn in millions of public and private sector workers and health, government, banking, education, and transport workers has been especially prominent. And it's about refuse to go to work until democracy is restored. So like young maternity, young, young twin, you know, um, don't go to work, um, don't work under the, the military. And uh, that <coughs> intended impact is to crush the economy. So having a crippling effect on international trade um, and, and confidence. So I recall a Nikkei Asia article, to, um, you know, that two months after the, um, the, the, the coups that crushed the economy to save Myanmar. So that's one of the uh, view of that. So the, the bank workers on CDM and banks closed, of course, is a severe shortage, uh, uh, a shortage in cash. And um, so we have this now three queues, very sad. So Myanmar people have to queue for cash, now queue for oxygen, and now queue for burial. So at the core of the banking crisis is the trust issue. The people of Myanmar have lost trust in the economy, in the, 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 the ability and the brutality of the regime, government, and, and started to withdraw money. So it's a trust issue is at the um, center of it. And manufacturing, this is what I, I study, has been very much affected with manufacturing closed and business activities down. And um, these industrial zones, they are the site of public protest and basic unions, union members and workers are the, at the forefront of this uh, uh, protest as well. So amid all that uh, problems, many international buyers have suspended their, their orders. So that has then affected um, uh, 
uh, you know, garment workers, you know, their, their job security, and, and many of them have fled to their homes in rural areas, as well as lack of jobs and income. So what we can do from outside, you know, with sanctions, you know, embargoes, of course, that's not as, as effective as your domestic sanctions. So you've seen uh, of in, you know, in, a, in a very big way, that's a call for the local boycotts of military linked products is another component of CDM. What they have uh, then uh, called for is in particularly to boycott products and services linked owned by militaries. As you know, military owns a lot of things, banking, telecommunication, and their consumer products. So much so that you have a, um, an app here it's called uh, uh, nay, nay, uh, uh, we, 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 nay, you know, don't, don't you know, buy this. Right, so that's what we want to talk about. So the sanctions, what the international business who are operating there, what, what are they supposed to do? So we have these unions, EU, UK have various sanctions. And to my uh, observation, they are slow and ineffective and not hitting where it hurts. But, you know, perhaps stay to come, hopefully. So the, the NUG, the alternative government, parallel government is what this call for is foreign companies not to provide revenues, for example, not to pay tax. So in this core oil and gas company, foreign oil and gas company has come to the core uh, uh, because um, they are the, 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 the most lucrative sector and then the large significant amount of revenue has been provided to the Myanmar government, which is the military now. So this time, what have they been, um, international businesses, what have they been called to do? So unlike in the previous round, right, and, uh, 1997, 1998, which I did my study on sanctions, in the past, they were called come back, diversed, come back, abandoned. But this time, no, three things, because we've more, more, um, yeah, my economy has far more opened up. You know, since 2011. So what they've been asked to do is condemn the coup strongly, to cut ties with the military, if you are working already with the military, to cut their ties and to heighten due diligence. So these are three things they've been asked to do. So what really with sanctions and um, international uh, organization, what in, they've been calling for is targeted sanctions focusing to hurt the economic interest of the military. So this call started before as well in 2019 was a, um, a report entitled the economic interest of the Myanmar military. So that's a UN fact finding mission report that focuses on or highlight that how military companies give, provide uh, revenue to the military, the, how the military used that to, um, at the time, you know, their the military operations against the Rohingya ethnic minorities. So we have now this uh, special, uh, uh, special administrative council for Myanmar. So we have this uh, uh, three cut strategies that they, they um, advocating. So one cut is that um, they're calling for a, a global three cut strategy and the Myanmar military one cut is that to cut the revenues and cut the cash and cut the unity. I have written three um, conversations articles also um, uh, um, you know, arguing that you know one of the key reasons for the military to stage this coup is to protect its own economic interests. So since then, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I've been known for this, and I've you know got a lot of the uh, media appearances on this. Okay, so the first case, first casualty, if you like, is the Kirin. Um, uh, uh, Bia withdrawn from, uh, or this uh, Kirin Bia terminated the joint venture arrangement with the uh, Myanmar um, economic holding companies as a military, one of the two military owned companies. So, but Kirin Bia, when you look at, went through two crises. The first crisis was uh, uh, the Rohingya crisis. Kirin Bia was defiant, didn't terminate uh, JV. Instead, it went to um, a launched uh, investigation to see how military uses this uh, proceeds from the breweries, how it uses. So if we can show the military uses money for something else, for pension or welfare, would have been all right. So, but that 
investigation. They even hired Deloitte to do it, but didn't come to any fruition because the military didn't come to um, cooperation. So, but in uh, uh, November 2020, Kieran did suspend all the dividends payment from the two breweries to the MEHL. But when the coup happened in four days, it terminated it. it, it um, the, the JV arrangement and issued this statement that they're deeply concerned what's um, going on. And also given the circumstances, they have no option but to um, terminate. And uh, uh, Vicky Center, Myanmar Center for Responsible Business, they also issued a statement um, to, to, you know, about, uh, uh, about um, their own, um, you know, business conduct and, and all the good things that these um, businesses are doing, signed by both uh, foreign business and, and local businesses. At the same time, also this Nikkei Asia article saying Asian companies stay quiet as Western peers condemn Myanmar coup. And uh, I was also on the uh, BBC talking about, you know, what international businesses, what are they going to do now? Are they uh, going to stay? Should I stay or should I go? I mean, that question has really emerged and still not resolved. Um, so the, the, the total energies of France is in the middle of it because they, they, this pipeline business provides a lot of money to the military. So um, Total CEO wrote an op-ed and um, arguing why they should be staying. They should keep paying taxes and revenues to the military. And I did a, a, a response rebuttal and uh, it's an op-ed in Le Monde. Okay, so Total, why Total said they're going to stay? So they said they stated that Total would not suspend gas production. Mind you, they were not asked to suspend gas production. What they've been asked to do is stay, but don't pay taxes. So the, the CEO said uh, decision not to uh, uh, pay taxes will be a failure to do so, would be a crime according to local laws and would put those in charge of the subsidiary at risk, which is also true because uh, definitely, uh, I, uh, you know, you are working under the very brutal regime, but that's also to, to excuse or to argue that I have to follow the local rules, therefore I keep paying taxes, is also not in accordance with the UN guiding principles. So that's not acceptable. So is that going business as usual, even under the military regime? So, um, so my argument is that in that uh, what CEO said, they had no recognition of the uh, government in exile, the CRPH and UG and also performs a daring act of reinventing in the field of human rights by pointing to the need to maintain production above all else because access to energy is a fundamental right. So this, you start to see foreign investors using this excuse or a, you know, a fact that we are providing essential right, essential services, you know, like electricity, telecom, therefore we should stay, we're doing a great job. And also, you know, this uh, CEO made the most appalling part of this intervention is an offer to donate to organizations that work for human rights in Myanmar, the equivalent of the taxes. So left hand and the right hand, so you keep paying taxes. And then the, on, the, on, the, on the other hand is it will also donate money to human rights courses. So this business providing essential goods, it, it has come to a fall, really. You know, so there's a crisis group that called to foreign tech, which is Telenor, uh, and telecom companies to help maintain internet access. So this is interesting. So in a Telenor case, we want to stop. And, um, you know, if, if it in conflict with your human rights commitments, come back, suspend. But with the, you know, different service with internet, we want them to stay. Um, but anyway, so... Telenor exited and um, Myanmar um, market. And uh, on that day, I was interviewed. And what I said was end of story with the people of Myanmar, who are hugely reliant on social media to send the messages out to promote their cause. You know, Junta has at times completely blocked internet access or certain social networks being used to organize a position. But that has implications for those who, who are still operating in Myanmar, what to do at a broader level. 
the exit of Telenor has pro proven, once again, it is not possible, increasingly not possible, to continue doing business in Myanmar under the military without breaking their commitment to human rights policies. I also noted that the companies, remaining companies like Chevron Total face a dilemma, human rights dilemma, as by remaining, they feel the tax coffers of the junta, but their departure would worsen the human rights situation further. But the question of, you know, increasingly difficult to remain in Myanmar. So the two things has happened. Um, it's a confidential order from Myanmar's, um, Myanmar's uh, post telecommunication and departments in mid-June said senior executives, both foreigners in Myanmar national must seek special authorization to leave the country. How could you, you know, operate in this sense? And also the last straw was that a second letter telling the telecom companies that they had until Monday, July 5th, to fully implement intercept technology. So this is a surveillance. So not possible to continue operating in such circumstances. So the telecom left. So, but telling or leaving draw a sharp criticism from the NGOs and uh, uh, rights groups because of not, not what they, they, why they left, who they sold it to. This is a Mikati family of a track record of telecommunication investment in authoritarian context, including Syria and Iran, which is omnipotent for their takeover of Telenor. Telenor is failing in its human rights responsibilities through the rapid fire sale to M1 Group. And a uh, 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 professor has also um, you know, uh, said that um, Telenor had left a moral problem to a company that is unlikely to share their concerns with abiding to the authorities' instructions. And uh, there's another one, a professor from Copenhagen Business School said that the UN guiding principles on business and human rights required telling not to assess the human rights consequences of the sale. So now the responsibilities don't end once you exit and you also have to see what you have left behind. But there are sectoral differences, okay? So these, um, say, uh, a garment manufacturers, they have, they labels have come back to um, resume their orders and then they have now also provided, um, uh, you know, jobs and um, uh, work to much needed um, in, in sectors. So I can start to see the sectoral difference. Some sectors we don't want them, some sectors we want them to come back. But going back to whether it's still possible to operate under the military, we have a um, UN working group on business and human rights, Professor Deaver said, there may be a point at which businesses might need to suspend operations or even consider an exit from the country if resource invo involvement in human rights abuses cannot be reasonably managed. While doing so in a manner to safeguard the well being of workers in affected communities. So now businesses call to stand against human rights violations. Amid all these sanctioned debates, you know. Um, businesses withdrawing, there is also a, a, a consideration, a huge consideration. I'm sure that's what, uh, you know, making these Western sanctions slow and ineffective and beating around the bushes that once these Western companies leave, we have to also consider who would have replaced and uh, our Western companies exist. And we have seen some, uh, I believe Chinese energy companies invested and after the coup, you know, who would have liked to? But yes, so some heavily invested after the coup as well. So now, in conclusion, what I've been seeing, this is the debate. First, businesses are being told to cut ties with the military. If you don't have ties with the military, you can stay. Then there is the divergence responses from the Western companies versus China and ASEAN companies. China and ASEAN companies is a business as usual. And then now we have that debate has become more, more uh, 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 fine grained is that if you can't abide by human rights, uh, UN guiding principles, then even if you don't have military tie, have to not can't operate anymore. But there is again to pull that 
uh, argument, we have this humanitarian argument that, you know, this is, this is a lot of people need, is are in dire need of help and we need assistance and uh, responsible businesses to stay. I think that debates will rage on and then I, I see that these sectoral differences will come in. Some sectors welcome to stay, some sectors, especially if you're providing a lot of money to the regime, that can be, uh, uh, be uh, very problematic. Thank you very much. I have to leave you with this um, you know, indecisions and uh, 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 divisions in their framing with their sanctions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Toy Tretain, and um, for this uh, presentation and insightful examination of the different aspects of the different costs that we are facing with the coup. We're moving into the question period. We already have at least four online questions. I'll group two, the first two. Both of them refers to the, one is very specific to the oil and gas companies um, and ask how feasible it is to withhold tax payments if they are continuing to work inside Myanmar. So that's one question. The second that I would like to attach to that one is how would you recommend the business firms to sustain their businesses under the junta, under the SAC? The business businessmen are Myanmar people, and they can sur they survive the crisis. How can they contribute at a time like this, Vicky? Yes. So, um, how feasible is it for oil and gas companies to withhold tax payments if they're continuing to work? I don't think it is feasible. It's a legal obligation to pay tax. Mm -hmm. The proposals that this can be put into a an escrow account, although they sound uh, superficially attractive, they are a breach of contract and they're a breach of law. Um, and if you look at the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises on responsible business conduct, then when it says, for example, if there are laws which infringe human rights and which therefore mean businesses can't act responsibly, what should businesses do? It says they should uh, do as much as they can to uh, resist while still continuing to obey the law. So obeying the law is a pretty fundamental uh, point for, for a business. And I think it's not something that we should um, suggest they should rip up lightly, despite the political attractions of it. So what Telenor, sorry, what Total did, and, and Chevron for that matter, was this sort of compensatory, okay, we recognise we would rather be paying this money direct to the people, uh, but we have an obligation to pay tax, but we will make an equivalent uh, payment uh, to NGOs. And I think um, beyond, I mean, I think although Patrick Puani said to human rights organisations, what Total and Chevron are much more looking at now is support for things like COVID relief. Um, I also just want to pick up on the point in Tui Tui's, um point about access to energy being a fundamental human right. You're right, it's not in the Universal Declaration, but again, in this present situation where everybody is seeking to get oxygen concentrators, you cannot operate an oxygen concentrator if you don't have electricity. So it is actually a fundamental enabler of the right to health right now. And obviously, you know, this is an extreme situation, but that is, is true at a... Uh, a more chronic level um, it, at times outside of the COVID crisis. Um, in terms of recommending to businesses about how to continue under the SAC, number one we say is do your enhanced due diligence all the time on you know who whose human rights are you impacting. Obviously, stay away from military, both in in business terms, but frankly, the number of businesses in that situation is minimal, at least of the international investors but also stay away from security forces in operational terms. The last thing you want is either the police or the military offering to keep your, your bank or your mind secure, secure for you. So minimize all contact with the military. And that includes at the, the protocol terms as well. What we're seeing now is businesses asking us, you know, can we talk to the regulator about this stupid thing that they have done to block imports at the border? Um, my advice is, don't go talking to, to ministers of the SAC, but you as a business have to work to the regulator. So at the, at the civil service level, if you've got an, a, an issue that needs to be raised, then you need to raise that, you know, otherwise um, you won't be able to, to function effectively. Um, and then, so second thing after enhanced due diligence, uh, including minimizing military links, is to be transparent. And I do think that one thing that Total could do better on is um, explaining more 
uh, graphically, literally in, in visual terms, what the different payments um, are, because many of the payments related to offshore oil and gas come from the customer, not from the, the producing company. And I don't think that, that those messages are, are clear enough. Um, I also think that in, in that particular case, the customer of the Thai government is um, extremely keen to get that gas and were Total to put itself in a situation as demanded by um, activists that you should do this and this. And if they were to get kicked out, then the next thing we would see is either MOGE or PTTEP technicians able to keep that gas flowing. So it's a really the consequence of, of that would be the exit of Total and no doubt a legal case but it wouldn't have, uh, have um, ended the payments by the ties uh, for, for purchase of the gas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, Dr. Tain, and I focus on the, um, some of the domestic uh, businesses, that the, how can they survive with the Junta? If you can contribute a little bit more to that as well. Well, it's a, I just want to comment on uh, what okay, Vicky sure. yes, Kisa said. Uh, I mean, it's all that... It's true, you know, it's an acute crisis, you know, we all come to rescue, but there is a danger in that they're legitimizing operating under uh, military and also, you know, your own um, you know, adherence to UN guiding principles and also your own um, human rights policies. Are you going to hang them for a while? Maybe that's a debate. Maybe that's a debate that mm, maybe that you yeah. should look at that as well. But, but right, absolutely. that really it's a debate legitimizes we've, the yeah. business as usual approach. But to, to say, absolutely, it's a debate we've been having on Telenor because Clearly, you know, Telenor are leaving um, or saying they're going to leave because they can't apply their human rights policies related to surveillance. But I think the question that we sitting here inside the country ask ourselves is, do we want a bunch of Lebanese and probably um, Myanmar players inserting themselves into that deal? Who will do surveillance or do we want Telenor doing surveillance? And this is this is a debate that we're having. Absolutely. Sorry. Yes, to no, you. No. Yeah. And a word about uh, uh about um, the domestic businesses and uh, as we are talking about the domestic businesses operating under the junta that's any, the thing domestic yeah thought about the role of cronies this i'm trying to squeeze some of the questions that are coming out one is uh, talking about domestic businesses um the role of cronies in the operating during the junta so I just refer to this um, uh, a cartoon that it says um, uh, uh, one of the cronies. You are uh, you you are on mute right now. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, While you fix that, can I answer the the sure, cronies sure. question because uh, it's a, an interesting one. There's some very good questions here. Um, I, I think there's not a single definition of crony. I, we should bear in mind, for example, that um, some of those who appear on crony lists, which are still coming out of activist groups in the US have been taken in and detained. I'm talking particularly of Zorzo um, and Aya Bank, Max. You know, there, there, are, there are significant business people who um, have sought to reform. Uh, and that's somewhat what I was referring to in, in my speech. Um, when I'm looking at KBZ Bank, for example, we have regular discussions with them about the different human rights risks they were facing for their employees. Um, around the, the interference of security forces, et cetera. Um, there are, though, what, what worries me is much more at the sub-regional level, the people who go out um, looking for land deals, uh, logging, um, you know, illegal uh, cross-border trade, um, and who will take advantage of this continued situation to continue to do those kind of land banking and other things. So it's, it's the ones whose names you don't know who are actually a much more um, corrupt, corrosive effect on the economy. But I per se, in terms of the coup, I don't think that cronies per se had any role in the coup at all. I think, unless you're, you're considering cronies as being part of those military families who are sitting in. in I don't Europe. think um, uh, crony will be happy about that. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can no. hear you. Go yes, ahead. So I don't think you cronies are happy. Yeah, cronies are ha happy about this. I mean, no one's happy about it, but they are, they are you know, sitting on the fence to see which way it's gonna fall. Um, so, so the small businesses, um, one guy I, I, I talked to, you know, he, he left the country and I said, why? Why you leave the country? Are you, he said, 
we can't do business with these guys, Amma, he said. We can't do business with these guys. But Myanmar people have lived under, you know, extreme condition. They will find a way. Businesses are very resourceful. They find a way. They find a way. Good. Uh, we have, we turn to the audience in Canberra uh, for a que live question. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, Edgar. Um, hi there, Vicky. My question's for you. Um, I just was wondering if you could characterize the capacity at the central bank um, and how that institution is looking a few months after the coup. Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I, I say this only in, on the basis of secondhand information from talking to banks, but uh, the people who are in the senior level position at banks now are very much of a sort of supervisory audit or command and control um, background and I think are not able to address the significant policy, economic policy challenges that the country is facing. And unfortunately, they're also now left without any um, support from the IMF or the World Bank, whatever Sean might have felt about it. So, so they have um, no one to, to turn to from that, that perspective, which is why a lot of the pronouncements you see from Governor Central and the De Deputy Governor of Bank serve to um, undermine confidence in the banks rather than um, uh, re-strengthen it, which is what we need, because I don't believe anybody's interests are, are going to be served by a banking uh, sector collapse, which kind of ties into the question we've got online about is economic self-destruct as called for by the people of Burma, well, I would say a few people of Burma, but, but not collectively, <laughs> a viable strategy to drive out and cause an all-out revolution against the junta. I don't think so. I, I used to, when I was ambassador, go and have coffee with Ludu Sain Win, um, who just lived along the street and who was kind of one of my, my sort of altar father type figures. And we were always arguing about this. And he was always uh, on for the, you know, bring them out on the street, people power, one last, one last spark. I don't believe it. I believe the strongest... Um, uh, you know, uh, demonstrations that we had were at a time when people had money in their pockets um, and felt comfortable. You know, we're talking February. I think as people become more and more desperate, they become more and more inclined to, um, you know, perhaps even even join as, you know, uh, informers or whatever in order to put uh, put bread on the table. Um, so, so I really don't believe that bringing people to a point of desperation is is the route to democracy. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. One more uh, question from the audience in Canberra. Please go ahead. Unmute yourself and go ahead. You are muted. Thanks so go much. Ahead. Uh, Veronica Taylor from ANU. Thanks for two really great presentations. I was interested, Vicky, when you identified gaps in the reform trajectory that you didn't mention the tax system. I know that it is a difficult time to be thinking or talking about tax, but I wonder whether that's at all on the agenda of the uh, the coup leaders, in part because that was the last conversation that I had with Sean uh, in okay. February where he nominated it as nominated it as the number one reform priority that hadn't really gained traction under the NLD up until that point. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, we, we talked a lot about tax with the, the IMF uh, advisors who were excellent on, on that um, and were very against tax holidays as well. Um, it, was, it was slow. And one of the reasons it was slow was the NLD was simply not re resourcing the tax uh, department properly. It was a kind of vicious circle of, oh, you know, we don't trust them. They're all crooks. Therefore, we're not going to give them resources. But also, I think, a failure to recognize how under-resourced it is, even compared to the Laotian tax department. I mean, the, the figures for the percentage of GNP spent on tax collection in Myanmar are through the floor. So there was a resourcing issue, which was fundamental. And then there was also the tax morale issue which needed to be built, that it was a good citizen's um, duty to pay tax, which again is why I'm very uncomfortable with the CDM don't pay tax movement, because I think the small gains that were made in recognising that taxes pay for public services will be unwound by, a, oh, well, actually, no, let's not pay tax. So, so yes, you're right, it didn't get very far, but it was going. And I do think that um, within the NLD finance minister, um, Carter and deputy finance ministers, all of whom unfortunately are still detained, um, that they, they understood it, but not enough had been done to sort of push that out through the system. And then they would undermine it themselves with these tax amnesties. 
which I think were very damaging because then all of the businesses who actually had been seeking to be legit and paying their 25% started asking themselves, well, why are we doing that? When, you know, a tax amnesty comes around and all the people who've been evading get, get let off. So, so I think there were some contradictions in the way in which the NLD approached tax, partly, I guess, as a sort of desperation to get the economy going. That was the, the reason that Uset Aung, I think, gave for the tax amnesty. I don't think it worked. Um, but, uh, but so, yeah, there was, it was a bit stop-start. But you have a military government. If you pay tax, they will use that money to buy arms. So why pay tax? Why well, pay well, your uh, electricity? Well, toy, 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 who do you think, how do you think they're going to buy the vaccines as well and so on? I mean, my, my sense is that this, this government doesn't um, get its resources... Uh, sorry, it, it doesn't pay its soldiers through tax. It pays them by saying, go and live off the land at the local oh. level. And we see that in the videos. We see them, you know, going and r ripping out the soft drinks from fridges and stealing people's mobile phones. And then at senior levels, it buys their loyalty by saying, you can have a nice posting on, on the, um, the Kachin border and make some money out of, of smuggling. So it's not a normal economy and I think if we further undermine that normal economy and public finances, we, we accelerate the destruction. And this is so we are starving cash access to the military. I know the logic, but I remember when I was ambassador and we were about to have the, the Daewoo, uh, Daewoo gas come on on stream. And the, um, the military at the time was busy buying its um, arms and other stuff from the Chinese, basically on the promise of of um, being paid back on the tax revenue. So there's also borrowing that, um, that the, the military can do. You know, the Russians don't do anything for yeah. free, but they, they may well do things for, for credit. Um, yeah, well, this is a topic, I mean, that will definitely generate a, a number of different views on, on public finance, but that is critical for the functioning of any economy. Um, we have to stop here. There are a couple of questions online that will be answered separately. But I want to thank on behalf of everyone, uh, please join me to thank Twitter Tain and uh, Vicky Bauman for an incredible and stimulating conversation to, that we had today. Thank you so much to both. My apologies to anonymous uh, attendee and to Twitter for interrupting. Pardon me. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Good to see you, Vicky. Keep talking. Bye. Bye. Yes. Thank you.